morning and welcome to the Wednesday morning roundtable for February 2022. We're delighted that you're able to join us online. Uh, for safety's sake, we have decided to go remote in February and we'll be assessing this as we go through every uh, month for the coming months. But this is the first in a series of uh, programs from the Wednesday morning roundtable looking at the impact of COVID on a number of fronts, including the economy, workforce development, as well as uh, healthcare. Uh, and in the end, at the end of May, uh, we will do our veteran services program that we have planned out. But today we wanna look at uh, the economy and uh, deal with it, not necessarily from a COVID perspective, but also looking at the short-term outlook of the economy and the markets. Uh, we're in an odd time, uh, like the 1970s and 80s, we have high inflation, uh, but we also have uh, the opposite of low unemployment, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So while the media might be talking about spikes in inflation, we want to look at both the macro uh, issues with Peter Nice of M&T Bay, and we're going to look at the markets with Tamar uh, Elzebagi uh, who, uh, from uh, Tompkins Trust, uh, excuse me, I should say Tompkins Financial advisors uh, who advises uh, the college on a number of fronts and we appreciate his work but we're looking at uh, the economy as a whole uh, as i mentioned uh, mr niece is with us uh, he has uh, come to us by way of meg o'connell one of our members of our steering committee uh, he uh, recently presented to center state ceo and uh, he is the group vice president of commercial planning and analytics at m t bank uh, he's been a bank veteran for 20 years and specializes in, and this is my favorite position, bank balance sheet forecasting and customer profitability. You may have to explain that on a national, uh, state and regional level. Uh, he analyzes economic data uh, to cater forecasts to the industries and regions that he covers. And previously he worked for business unit CFO uh, covering commercial and support units uh, to the bank. Uh, when he's not at work, he is watching his daughter play vo volleyball and his son play hockey and baseball. So he's a winter summer sports guy. So he's going to look at the uh, larger uh, macro issues and then we'll turn to uh, Tamara to talk more about the markets. So Mr. Neese, welcome. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Or thanks for the time today. Uh, I think what I'll do first, I'll, uh, uh, Guy, is I'll bring up some slides uh, that I used at that presentation uh, that you mentioned uh, mentioned earlier. So I do that real quick right now. So when we think about, sorry about that, when we think about um, what's going to happen over the next uh, next year, what's what's really crazy is there's a bunch of things coming on. And guy, you 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 talked on it. You 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 touched on it uh, um, at, in your thoughts. Is right now the biggest thing kind of everybody's had is inflation. And we're really thinking about what, well, what's driving that as we look uh, both what has happened and what's going to happen. So we'll kind of talk about the three things we think are, are driving that. First, we look at labor, and labor is a labor is a big issue for the economy right now. As anybody who's had to try to hire anyone uh, or has been um, dealing with any of the wage costs that go along with it, it continues to be a struggle. Unemployment is at record low, and I'll, I'll kind of talk about what that means and what's driving that. But obviously there's a, a, a huge labor shortage across almost every industry. Um, and, 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 and the cost of those uh, of that labor continues to increase at a level we haven't seen in, in quite some time. Um, we continue to see supply chain, supply chain issues uh, across almost every industry, whether you're trying to buy a car or uh, lately seems like trying to buy cream cheese, uh, you can't find either uh, uh, without, without a lot of work and a lot of effort. Um, and we all know just, you know, th that's all just driven by what's happened in our supply chain, you know, from getting uh, goods overseas to just getting them through our ports to even just getting onto, onto the shelves. Third, you know, we have a lot of um, pent up demand uh, and people have been saving money. Nobody, you know, for a long time, there weren't very many trips that were being taken. Uh, we had government stimulus that was out there. These were things that were, you know, increasing, you know, household um, net value or net worth. Uh, and again, these three things combined. So you have a, 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 a you know increased cost of labor, harder to find goods, and people with you know more disposable income. And when you put those three together, you wind up with inflation. And we've seen that you know in 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 spades over the past few months. 
you know, the most recent data that came out on, on at the end of last week showed inflation was, I think, north of 7%, which is just an incredible number when you think about where we've been over even the past 20 to 25 years. Um, you know, how companies deal with this over the, the coming year, these three things and, and inflation will, um, will be, you know, key to their success as they look forward. We do expect, um, you know, some of our economic, economic forecast show inflation probably, you know, starting to, to, to temper or to wane over the next few months uh, as we get kind of back to a little bit more normalcy, but we'll have to keep an eye on that. As we look ahead, we talk about the, the labor market, you know, and now, you know, overall employment is still down a couple percentage points over what it was a couple years ago. Um, you know, that's, that's crazy way there still is, you know, even though there's still 3 million, 3 million less jobs, um, there's a lot less people looking for those jobs. You know, one of the things that's um, amazing to see is even when you look at the number of open jobs relative to the number of unemployed, you know, the fact that there's over, you know, around a job and a half for everybody who's looking for work, you know, that's something we haven't seen, you know, pretty much in most of our record, you know, some of the records we have going back. Um, you know, if you want a job, there's there's typically one to be found. It's kind of matching up, you know, where the jobs are, the skill set, and then the people. So even though employment hasn't necessarily recovered, there still is plenty of job opportunities. And when we think about why, you know, the, the overall labor participation rate hasn't recovered, there's really, we kind of think of it in two things, two ways. One is by age and then by education. By age, for the most part, those in the, you know, kind of you know, working class age, kind of pre-retirement age, um, they've pretty much recovered. They're, you know, near 99% for the, the those that haven't. That's typically something where they've figured out a different way to, to, to structure their financial life uh, to not necessarily have to go back to work, whether that's a single parent working uh, or only working part-time, things of that nature. Um, where we've seen a huge loss in, in labor force participation is those that were kind of in the, you know, kind of the age 55 and over, those heading into retirement. There's really a couple of reasons driving that. You know, the stock market, it went up, although it initially blipped, obviously, right after the pandemic started. It's come back fairly strong, leaving them in fairly strong financial health. Um, you know, the other side of it is, too, is that, unfortunately, this group tends to be predisposed to, you know, issues with, with what's happened during the pandemic, um, whether they had they were immunocompromised from a, from a health standpoint or just didn't want to take the risk of, of being in a, in, a, in a mixed environment. You know, they've decided to stay away uh, at this point. Whether they come back, I'm, I'm not sure. It'll take some time um, to determine whether that, that actually happens. The other side of this is, is where they are in their education. Those that are college educated or higher tend to you know, do pretty well. They obviously weren't quite as impacted as those who weren't. Um, and they've tended to stay in, uh, in the workforce. Um, where we've seen the biggest issue, again, is in the, those that are um, you know, only high school educated. Those obviously tend to be at the lower end of the, obviously um, skewed lower in terms of pay. And we've seen those are the hardest group to come back. They were, you know, obviously they got a, a decent benefit from uh, unemployment insurance. Um, you know, you could, I think in New York, I think um, between the two unemployment insurances, the, the federal and then the state value, I think it was somewhere near a 50 or so thousand dollar a year job equivalent uh, of, uh, you know, for, for those roles. As that's you know turned you know gone away, some of those benefits have gone away. We've seen some increase in participation, but again, these people want to get paid for for what they what they want. Um, you know, paying minimum wage uh, isn't necessarily going to work as we move forward. They're they're definitely commanding, you know, a higher wage, and we see that work its way through the entire wage uh, wage bracket. Um, as I said, wages are going up. Um, this looks at a two-year annualized growth, so you kind of take that 3.7%. What it's saying is two years ago, wages are 7% higher now than they were two years ago. And they've been going up for, you know, other than that little break around the pandemic, they've been growing up rather, uh, going up rather precipitously. So again, it's, it's not just there, there's less people and there's a definite a, a need for those, um, you know, a definite need to, to increase the pay of those people. You know, it, it, as, as you know, I'll take my own personal experience. We all probably have had experiences in hiring people over the last six to nine months. Um, you know, anybody who's in that eight to 12 year out of school kind of uh, look, they are looking, they, they are probably what I think is in some of the most demand in terms of the professional side. We're seeing a lot of um, people, uh, you know, uh, recruited in that area. And there's a changing dynamic, obviously, here. 
you don't need to live where you work. That that's a that's a new thing um, that really has taken hold. You can live in Buffalo, you can live in Ithaca, and you can work for a company in Atlanta, Chicago. Pick a big city. Uh, you get the benefits of of a smaller town, and you get you know some you know the, the, the idea of working for what is like a, probably a national company. You go to you go to the corporate headquarters maybe two or three times a year, and and it works out for you. You know it works out for everybody involved. So again, the dynamics, especially, you know, we think about a region like Syracuse uh, or just upstate New York, they're the ones who are gonna feel this kind of outsourcing of jobs to people taking jobs in other areas, not necessarily the people leaving. So there's a benefit in a, in a kind of, uh, there's two sides of this coin. The benefit is they're bringing the, way, the wages back to the region they're living in. The downside is the, you know, you know, the local companies are making it more difficult to find, find those people. So again, we just see that, you know, as, we, as we've moved along. All of these trends, they're, they're not unique to, you know, you know, they're just similar to what we see in, you know, central New York or upstate New York in general. We see all these same issues. And really, like I've said, the, the key for companies, as we think about what companies have to do, the key for companies as they move forward is how do they manage all of these different issues? How do they manage their employees and their supply chains? And how are they going to evolve or adapt over time? Um, you're not going to, um, the, the idea, like I said, in, a, in the center state um, conversation, you're, you're not going to just be able to say to people, well, the, the job is Monday to Friday, eight to five, we'll see you. If you have that, you know, for obviously for certain industries, that's probably more of a requirement. But for where the industries where it's not, it, it's going to be, a, um, you're going to have to evolve, with, you know, and be agile with what, what the changing dynamics are, especially with those that necessarily were you know, barely, you know, I've just come into the workforce to run the pandemic or haven't even worked, you know, lived through the pandemic. They're going to expect flexibility in the, you know, the, you know, the number of days they're at work and their work location. They've learned how to work at home. They've learned how to work out of town and, and they want, they love and like that flexibility. So I'll, I'll pause there, um, turn it back to you, Guy, and, uh, and then we'll uh, continue from there. Thank you, Peter. We'll now uh, turn to uh, Tamar, who's going to uh, talk to us a little bit about what the market forecast uh, looks like. Um, as many of you know, uh, Tompkins Trust is a sponsor of the Wednesday Morning Roundtable, so we were delighted to be able to get someone from uh, Tompkins Financial Advisors uh, to join us uh, this morning to talk uh, to everyone. Uh, Mr. Elzelberry Boggy is the Vice President and Senior Portfolio manager for Tompkins Financial. He's responsible for four billion across the firm's investment strategy. Some of that is the Community College's uh, foundation. We hope he does even better uh, this coming year. He's had a good couple of months as a member of the investment committee. Uh, he brings uh, more than 23 years of investment experience to portfolio management and fundamental uh, investment research. He has spent a decade, he spent a decade with uh, Brandywine Global Investment Management in Philadelphia. Uh, as an equity analyst for the firm's large cap strategies, uh, assets on, and had assets on about uh, seven billion there. And prior to joining Tompkins uh, in 2017, uh, he was a portfolio manager and head of research at John Allman Associates in Corning, New York, with oversight of about a billion dollars there. He's in all uh, in uh, outside of uh, work. He is uh, on the board of the Women's Opportunity Center as well as Tompkins County Youth Services uh, in Ithaca, New York. Uh, uh, Mr. Halsenberg, uh, welcome to the Wednesday Morning Roundtable. Thank you, Guy, I really appreciate it. Uh, this is a wonderful forum and, and I think the presentation and discussion is very timely just given uh, all the volatility that we've seen, not just in the equity markets, but also within the fixed income space, which we'll get into in just a second. So uh, generally speaking, to kind of you know frame out in terms of the discussion itself. And I'm going to get this set up just a second. In terms of just framing out the discussion itself, ultimately, let's look at where we've been, kind of where we're at today, and ultimately where we're likely to go. And so with regards to the markets themselves, you look over the past roughly 26 years, and we've been in a pretty good position when you look at the equity markets. There have been times of meaningful volatility, which is without question, when you look at, you know, for instance, the tech bubble back in 99, you look at, at what we saw 
during the great financial crisis and market drawdowns there. And even more recently, when you look at the height of the pandemic back in 2020, where you saw equity markets fall by about 34%. So really, when you look historically, the times that we've seen excess levels of volatility and uncertainty, that over time, those moments in time have been met with certainty, but certainty at a higher level. And so as long-term investors, one of the things that we do want to stress is, you know, really staying the course, but ultimately the times that you're most uncomfortable to invest is usually the best time to be putting money to work. Now, as you look at the markets uh, year to date, really when you look across the US, you look across Europe, you look across Asia, we're seeing notable declines. Within the US, you're seeing the S&P now down about a little over 7%. NASDAQ, which is a very tech heavy index, is down almost 12%. And Russell 2000, which is a broad measure of small cap stocks is down about 9.6%. Over in Europe, a little bit of a mixed bag, but you are seeing some outperformance in areas such as Germany, such as the UK, uh, you look at France, they're all outperforming, generating for the most part negative performance year to date. We are seeing some relative outperformance there. And over, uh, over in Asia, you are seeing a little bit of a mixed bag, but generally when you look at Japan, when you look at China, we are seeing some declines within those indices, again, overseas. Now, what's interesting is when you look at fixed income, fixed income traditionally has been that steady eddy where you're really not making that much money, but you're generating some performance. It tends to be an anchor. And when you look at performance year to date, it's a continuation of what we've seen last year. So last year, when you look at the US Bar Barclays Aggregate Bond Index, that index, which is a broad measure of fixed income securities in the US, that index was down about 1.7, 1.8%. You're seeing losses accelerate year to date, now down to about 3.5%. You're really not insulated when you look from a quality perspective, uh, even in high quality issues, you're still seeing negative performance uh, within, within areas such as AAA rated issues. And even as you start to get down lower within the credit quality spectrum, accelerated losses uh, are very much evident. You look from a duration standpoint of maturity, the longer you are, you're seeing those losses even that much worse. And generally, whether you're invested in treasuries, corporates, or securitized debt, you're still seeing losses. Ultimately, the basis behind why you're seeing declines in fixed income is going to be a function of where we're seeing interest rates today. They've continued to climb higher, again, with a lot of the points that Peter mentioned with inflation, that's pushed up rates higher again, resulting in some of the losses that we've seen there. Now, when you look at the US, generally, the economy is doing quite well. We're likely to see close to about a 6% GDP number growth when you look at 2021. And when you look at just manufacturing and services activity uh, here in the US as measured by the PMI, which is Purchasing Managers Index, anything over 50 shows expansion anything below 50 shows contraction. So as you can see with manufacturing, the economy is still expanding, it's still growing. From a services standpoint, it's growing a little bit faster just as the economy has started to really reopen, we're seeing good demand and ultimately services continue to do quite well. Now, one of the biggest problems that we're seeing as of late and really when I say as, as of late, it's over the last, call it six to 12 months, where inventory levels just aren't keeping up with demand. And so this is a measure of looking at inventory levels to sales. And as you can see, they continue to decline since the height of the pandemic. To kind of put some numbers uh, together with this graph, you saw sales that grew year over year towards the end of last year, year over year, up 17%, whereas inventory levels only grew about 8% we ultimately weren't able to fulfill the demand that we're seeing uh, within the economy overall. That's translated into congestion at the ports, congestion along uh, the rails, along trucking, uh, you know, really any mode of transportation, you're seeing a lot in the way of congestion. So this is a, uh, what they call a terminal congestion index to kind of give you a sense when you look at the blue line here, this is North America, can, North American congestion, as you can see, it continues to trend higher. We've seen a little bit of a decline here, but when you look over in Europe, 
it continues to accelerate as those economies are really reopening, it's weighed on congestion and ultimately has pushed through higher prices. Again, as Peter mentioned, it's no surprise. We got about a seven and a half percent headline number on inflation on CPI, which is generally higher than where we've been historically. It's higher as compared to where the Fed has been targeting. And really those are the factors that we're seeing on the basis of low inventory and, and constrained supply chains. Uh, the biggest, I would say, factor in terms of pushing up price is gonna be energy. You look at oil for you know, most of 2021, we were anywhere from that 50 to maybe $60 range in terms of oil. Today, we just saw it cross $95 a barrel. And so you're seeing prices uh, with oil, prices at the pump continue to move higher. And that's weighed on the economy overall. Now, with all that said, you've seen the economy, or rather the Fed, I should say, make an abrupt change in terms of their stance on inflation and their stance as it pertains to future rate hikes. So it wasn't only several months back where you had the Fed telling investors, look, we are not going to raise rates until through 2023. This is a chart that's projecting how many rate, rate hikes the Fed is expected uh, to do over the next 12 months. And so you look at, at this graphic here and ultimately it tells you that over the course of the next 12 months, we're expected to see about six rate hikes. This is currently what's being priced into the market. Again, a complete shift from where they were several months back. And again, a lot of it's due to the inflation that we're seeing in the economy. We talked about unemployment. Unemployment continues to decline from uh, the levels that we saw back in April 2020, now down around 4%. Wages, as Peter mentioned, continues to grow, which is a good thing when you look at negating and dampening uh, some of the pricing pressures that we're seeing uh, across the board. Now, there are factors to kind of consider outside of wages moving up that ultimately is a net positive when you look at the prospects of the economy on a go forward basis. We're all doing much better from a net worth perspective. This is looking at household net worth. And you look even as compared to prior, uh, rather prior to the, uh, excuse me, the great financial crisis, when you look at net worth, we're over double where we were as compared to that time period. You've seen clearly an appreciation of stocks. So 401ks, uh, have gone up nicely. And of course, housing has also done quite well. So generally speaking, Americans are in really good shape. We have a lot of wealth. We have a lot of savings, again, as Peter mentioned, which is very much net positive. When you look at delinquencies on everything from credit cards to student loans to mortgages, auto loans, home equity revolving debt, delinquencies continue to decline. We did a lot in the way of not only adding to our savings during the pandemic, but we've also paid down credit card debt and other debts uh, within our respective personal balance sheets. And that's all a net positive when you look at the economy, considering the fact that our spending accounts for about two thirds of GDP here in the US. COVID case counts. This is looking at COVID case counts uh, worldwide. They continue to decline and we're seeing a much more dramatic decline in new case counts here in the US. When you look at corporations, particularly when you look at S&P 500 companies, companies are reporting very, very strong earnings. For 2021, we're expecting to see earnings growth year over year of about 45 to 50%. So an incredible jump when you look at profitability for companies and you might say, all right, well, 2020 was probably a horrendous year. Well, it wasn't all that great, but the number was down about 10%. So if you start to spread out and look over a two year, call it stack period, you're looking at uh, earnings growth that's well in excess of what we've seen historically. Now, one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing as an investor four times a year, and this spans over the course of several weeks, is listen to the conference calls and review the transcripts of what CEOs and CFOs are saying within their respective businesses. You know, this really gives you a good perspective and good, good uh, lens in terms of ultimately 
where we're going, some of the competitive pressures that you know CEOs are seeing, uh, some of the factors that potentially uh, can allow us to kind of put together our outlook on the economy and where things are likely to go. And you know, generally speaking, as you can see, costs are moving up. We all know this. You know, Tyson reported an unusually high number when you look at their cost of goods sold and what happened there. That number was up almost 18%. That resulted in them pushing through pricing of almost 20%. What was interesting within that respective business is that they didn't see volumes fall off a cliff. Volumes actually continued to expand. Now, granted, they were up about 1%, but generally that demand still stuck. A lot of CEOs, whether it's Union Pacific, Dow, uh, they're pointing to the idea that they expect to see in the back half of 2022, supply chains getting better, inventory levels getting better. Bank of America, Brian Moynihan, very well-respected CEO, talks about how ultimately you look at spending uh, during the holiday season, and that was up 26% over pre-pandemic levels. Disney, we all know their products, we all know their parks, they are expensive as you know what, they reported a 40% growth when you look at per capital spending as compared to 2019. The consumer, again, is very much flush with cash and is spending and continues to be ready to spend as the economy reopens. You're not seeing demand slow down at all, whether it's Whirlpool or even waste management, uh, one of the largest or the largest, I should say, waste disposal company in the country where typically their customers that are very much price sensitive have been renewing contracts at much higher rates and been okay with it. And so generally, as you listen to what companies are saying today, fundamentals remain strong and ultimately demand is not slowing down even though they are taking up price. Now, a couple of slides I think worth mentioning. One of the things that we hear from uh, investors a lot of time is, look, you know, rising interest rates are typically bad for stocks. You know, you definitely want to be out of stocks as rates rise. And we would argue the exact opposite. Ultimately, when you look historically at, for instance, periods over the last 15 years in looking at the 10-year treasury yield, so where the yield really jumped up during these time periods, we've seen stocks up double digits, and more specific to tech stocks, that they've outperformed in four out of these five time periods. Now, you might say to yourself, all right, well, what about with the Federal Reserve? You know, they're going to be probably, you know, aggressive and starting to raise rates as soon as next month. Historically, this is a research coming from uh, LPL or a chart from, from LPL that ultimately looked at what the stock market did over the next three, six, and 12 months. On average, we've seen stocks up 10% following the first rate hike. That was positive 85% of the time. You might say to yourself, all right, well, what about war? We've got conflict with uh, Ukraine and Russia. We have issues with China and Taiwan. What does that mean for stocks? And so this is research going back uh, and looking at, at prior time periods where ultimately from start to finish during the duration of war, that stocks have been positive. Now granted, prior to war, you know, ultimately stocks have sold off. You've seen a drawdown on average of about five to maybe 10%. But generally throughout the duration, and this is even looking more recently at the Gulf War, where we did see uh, stock prices continue to grow. And this was evident primarily in large cap stocks, but really across most asset classes, uh, with the exception of small cap stocks and specific to, to the, uh, the Gulf War. Now, as we put together again, sort of our outlook. The economy continues to be poised for continued growth. Now, granted, we're not gonna see a 6% headline number on GDP here in the US, but ultimately as supply chains begin to improve, as we start to get inventory coming back on shelves, that in our minds is a net positive. We're also looking at the labor market, which continues to be extremely resilient. One of the things, as Peter mentioned, that we're hearing from companies is the inability to hire not just good talent, but really any talent. And so we think that the labor market will continue to be strong, which gives consumer confidence, 
a boost on that front. We think, again, the consumer remains in great shape. Ultimately, with regards to inflation, we think that that will begin to moderate towards the back half of this year. And longer term, we think inflation is going to remain fairly low. You do have technology and, and really companies and consumers embracing technology that tends to be deflationary in nature. And lastly, we think earnings will continue to be strong, not to the tune of about 45% uh, as compared to what we saw in 2021, but we should have, I think, earnings that may surprise investors on the upside. Now with that, I'm going to pass it back to Guy for any questions. So thank you, Tamar. Uh, a couple of, uh, I don't want to bounce all over the place with both of you, but there are a couple of uh, trends that you mentioned uh, besides the uh, unavailability of cream cheese for dips for uh, Super Bowl parties yesterday, uh, as we tape this on Monday. Uh, but there are some items that are out there that I just wanted to ask both of you to, or one or the other to, uh, to chime in. So obviously uh, the big issue for many has been this issue of inflation. You mentioned the 7% uh, report on Thursday of last week. Um, but when you do have unemployment at 4% and it is tough to hire employees, uh, whether it's at a, a high end or going through the drive-through and you have a, about a half a million jobs added to each of the last several months, what is the, what can the Fed do to deal with just inflation, but not at the same time drive up unemployment, which would seem to be a, a concern as we're rebounding from the uh, pandemic? Um, I can go first. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that to start. I mean, I, I think ju just what it's, it's starting to do, obviously, it's changed its tenor over the past six months from, you know, we wouldn't have very, we'd be very slow and measured in rate hikes to signaling and then the market was, you know, to what uh, Tamar uh, pointed out, just an, an enormous, you know, five, six potential rate hikes over the next uh, year. That's similar to what we're seeing as well. You know, I, I think it, I, I don't know that it'll, I think it'll help curb inflation to some degree. Um, I think inflation, even if the Fed were to do minimal, I think would still come down over the back half of the year. I, I think they're doing what they can to slow it down, but I think in, it, would, it, would, it would slow itself down. At the same time, that doesn't mean that prices are gonna go down. It just means they're not gonna go up quite as quickly. Um, so don't, don't think that the prices we're seeing now are gonna change you know, dramatically. I, you know, an easy example for me is I have a, a uh, family member who owns a restaurant and she just raised prices again, another one or $2 on every item because her costs are going up as well. And, and that's just not gonna change. Tamara, I don't know if you wanna hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I would definitely agree. I mean, I think, I think the worst thing that the Fed can do is be extremely aggressive with rate hikes because clearly I think that's gonna put a chokehold on the economy. I think that the best thing they can do is ultimately, you know, maybe do one or two rate hikes and then just sort of take a wait and see type approach and see if things, you know, slow down, you know, see in terms of what happens with prices if they do begin to improve and, and not grow as much as, as we've seen as of late. But again, you know, the, the biggest challenges that we're seeing are again, supply chains and again, inventory levels. And I think that should start to improve. And that's ultimately what we're hearing from, uh, from businesses. So again, it's, it's really going to be the Fed, you know, not being too aggressive, just sort of being you know, more measured in terms of their approach. And before getting back over to supply chain for a second, just uh, have the markets taken into effect that the Fed is going to do these raises? And more importantly, why the weight by the Fed? Yeah, I think I think they were they were caught flat footed is, is the biggest thing. I mean, they, you know, they didn't anticipate that rates would that inflation would be as strong and long lasting as it has been thus far. You know, you also look at, at different factors, whether it's oil, where, you know, again, inventory levels remain low and there's not much in the way of supply coming online that's naturally pushing prices up. And so, you know, I think ultimately they were, they were caught flat-footed, whereas they should have been a little bit, you know, quicker with, you know, with that, uh, that decision-making. And I think that, you know, the other point also to mention is, the markets have anticipated, which is why you're seeing stocks down this year, 
you know, there is that concern that they're, they're going to make potentially a policy mistake, which ultimately is concerning to, to investors. And so, you know, that has ultimately weighed on, on prices, not just here, but again, on, uh, on a global basis. And, and besides the supply chain issues that we, we hear about at the grocery stores and, and more importantly, whether it's a, a cargo ship getting stuck in the middle uh, of uh, uh, a heavy travel area, do you, do you see these supply chain issues uh, resolving themselves sooner than later? And how much impact do they have, uh, if I can make this more complex, on inflation? I, I, you know, Samer, you can, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll top in first here. I mean, I think it's going to take a while because it's, it's not necessarily the raw product that's the problem with with some of these supply chain issues. It's a component. So, it's not, um, you know, the way we think about it is, it's not the cream cheese. It's the container that it comes in. So, there's plenty of cream cheese out there, I'm not, I, and I'm not sure this is the case, but I'm saying there's plenty of cream cheese out there. It's the, it's, it's the container that comes in that's the problem. The car example is an easy one. There's plenty of cars out there. There's a chip it needs. Um, to, to, you know, the, the, the issue is typically a chip issue, and and those are the those are the problems. You know, um, again, you're buying cars now, one on spec, and two with known defects, with you know a known recall. It says, hey, when we get this chip in, we'll call you back, and then whatever that chip covered, we'll start working again. So I don't I don't necessarily you know think that there's a quick solution to a lot of these issues. It's going to take time to work itself out. So, Tamara, your thoughts? Yeah, I would say it's going to take time. You know, again, I'm, I'm sort of leaning more towards that back half of the year type timeline where, where I do think, you know, things will improve. I mean, we are, you know, trying our best to try to get, you know, again, you know, more capacity on the rail lines, you know, more in the way of, of alleviating some of the constraints at the ports. And so, you know, I think I think these things again will resolve themselves. I think again, it's a back half type timeline. Uh, but generally, if it does extend longer, you know, to your question, it, it probably will result in in pricing moving up at least for the foreseeable future. And so, as we you mentioned Ukraine, uh, we'll talk about China in a second. I do want to go and also talk about the, the job market. But going back for a second, you know, if if as we tape, as we're taping this on Monday afternoon, there's more news about you know artillery pieces being brought up to the border, uh, et cetera. And one of the key factors on an economic point of view are rare gases that Ukraine uh, produces or has in availability that run the economy of the West. So, what is your outlook for the the foreign outlook in the sense of impacts on the economy, whether it's Ukraine? And I know everybody has goodwill right now with China because we're in the second week of the Olympics, but that all wears off in about two. What do you see as both Russia and China as impacts on the uh, economy, at least in the West? Yeah, I mean, I think I think those are major concerns. These are major factors to consider, you know, as an investor. I think that the outcome will likely not be good if if, if there is conflict. Uh, I do believe that level heads and cooler heads will prevail and that, you know, ultimately, you know, we'll get past this without any type of, of major undue harm. But, um, you know, again, the, the sort of the scenario behind, you know, whether it's, it's commodity prices, stock prices, what have you, if, if there is, uh, in fact, conflict is, is not going to look good, you know, in the near term, you know, you will see meaningful drawdowns in the market, you'll see uh, prices moving higher. Uh, but generally as a long-term investor, I would very much, I'd hate saying it, but very much welcome those opportunities because you're you're really buying stocks on sale at that point, again, with that long-term time horizon. I don't know, Peter, if you had... Uh... No, I think you summed it up well. I don't think I have, I don't have anything to add there. So I, I'd like to go about the job market because obviously that's an, uh, impactful for our members. So there, there seems to be uh, two or three things impacting all at once. One's this uh, great resignation uh, that we keep hearing about. Um, we're all changing the way we work. 
Um, I do not know Mr. Neese or I would be uh, doing, I'm assuming that is your home uh, behind you because I saw somebody walking behind you that looked shorter than most um, adult employees. And so uh, two years ago, we would not be doing this. Uh, so how is the great resi uh, resignation, this issue of remote working, not being able to fill positions How's it changed the markets? How is it changing the economy? You know, it's changing the economy because it's it's forcing, you know, it's forcing you to 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 break old habits, um, which tend to die hard. Um, you know, it, how how you work, how you live, how you work in this new economy as we all kind of get back to the office. You know, MNT just announced its um, return to office uh, plans last week. You know how we get back to the office is changing, and and it, it impacts the economy. As I mentioned, you know, um, you know, that transferability of 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 people to live in one place and work in another, you know, forces people to rethink how important is it that a you're in the office or b that that job is sourced, you know, um, sourced locally, and also just what what does that mean from you know, and I don't I don't even know that I you know maybe Tamar has, but what, what does that mean in terms of like, I don't know, it's wealth or income redistribution around the country as, you know, maybe it'll be not enough to make a difference, but, you know, as we start to see people live in one place and work in another, they're bringing obviously their, their income to a different spot from where they work and, and will that matter? Um, you know, we'll have to kind of see how that works, but as I kind of mentioned in my notes, as, as, a, as a business leader, you have to be um, agile in how you think about those things and, it's it's not something that's done easily. Um, you know, even at the bank, we're we've had plenty of discussions about what will return to the office uh, look like uh, going forward. How necessary is it for to be in whether it's one day, three day, or five days a week? Yeah, the the only thing I'll I'll add to that, you know, I think I think you you know with technology, exactly how we're doing this presentation discussion, you, you'll have a broader you know, more broader access to talent and talent, you know, nationally for that matter. And so, you know, I think that's a net positive. And, and I would even argue that you probably see more in the way of productivity. You know, I think to myself, you know, during COVID, during, you know, while, while I was at home, that ultimately I was working more, I, you know, granted I had more flexibility, uh, you know, with my hours, but I was finding myself working more and, and getting actually more done. You know, there's, less in the way of dealing with traffic and commutes. And, you know, the only distraction is, you know, maybe my one and a half year old and French bulldog barking in my ear. But otherwise, you know, there is a lot in the way of productivity. I think that's, that can be, you know, had, uh, you know, with how things are being set up today and, and likely on a go forward basis. Can I ask a couple of questions about just small things that might impact the economy that we just don't know about yet, but maybe you have all been looking at. So um, two were heavily advertised over the last two days. And I think if I see one more sports betting uh, ad, uh, whether it's Caesars or whoever, not uh, underwrite, we're now going from an economy that had a lot of betting, it looks like underground, especially in New York and New Jersey, uh, to being much more of a factor. And we saw some numbers from New York of the growth. How does that impact the economy? Uh, either the, the below the economy or above the economy, what we report? Um, it's gonna take a while. You know, what, what it does change is how easy it is, right? I mean, it, it's, it's gonna, you know, it's gone from to your point an underground or a destination thing, right? You had to be at a place to, here's my phone, five clips, you know, five, excuse me, five, you know, taps of the screen and I've just, you know, put a hundred dollar parlay down on, on, on a game. So it, the ease of it is there, whether enough people will actually buy into it to have an impact. I mean, I know the numbers are gaudy, but then when you start to think of, you know, the impact, how big an economy is, they send a, you know, big numbers over big numbers don't necessarily make a, a huge impact. But I don't know, Tamar, your, your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I think incredibly well said. I mean, the, the, definitely the ease factor, I think is, is what's concerning. And then you, you know, I sort of relate that to, what we're seeing with those meme stocks, you know, the game stops of the world, the AMCs and, you know, how a lot of people are, are making 
massive bets on these companies that you know have bad balance sheets, don't generate a lot in the way of a free cash flow, and are just fixated on this idea that you know they can strike gold with with these underlying investments. And you know we've been seeing over this this most recent downturn in the market that these guys are losing their shirts. You know they've been been making these huge investments and just completely you know losing just a ton of money. And so you know I think I think that ease is is the the biggest concern that I have. I mean, will it really make a dent? In terms of the economy, probably not, but you will hear stories of friends or, or others that, you know, definitely have, have lost quite a bit of money, uh, even similar to what you saw back in uh, in 2000 at the tech bubble. So the other one that's a weird one for me is this issue of the cryptocurrency. And so last night there was an ad that you could put your QR code up to, and I was stupid enough to do that last night. Uh, just to see which who was selling what and was it crypto but to me crypto is a uh, currency is different from on this economy for two reasons one it's a means of investing for some and i know uh tamar you and i were in a meeting maybe uh, four months ago uh, there were some ads the night before and people were asking is that a good investment but it's also a currency issue now and you know we have some on the west coast of the united states there are some governments who are looking to take crypto as payment how does crypto impact an economy that, you know, and really a world economy that's based on the U.S. dollar? I don't know, Peter, if you wanted to. <laughs> Nobody wants to take this, this one. This is a, the, the, to me, I, I don't really have much to say other than this. This is going to be the, you know, uh, this is the internet of 35 years ago, and or this is smartphones of 15 years ago. How this evolves over the next couple of years, right? I mean, the volatility is is a big thing. I mean, and and the lack of potential lack of knowledge, right? Someone just thinks they understand Bitcoin, but they really don't. And so, um, how how that kind of comes about over the next few years is going to be huge. I mean, you know, if you look at just Bitcoin, which is just probably the most pop, you know, most infamous or popular of of them. There's obviously many others. You know, it's not uncommon to see swings of very large amounts in very short periods of time. And if you're if you're not well educated, um, you know, all the comments that Tamara just said about um, about what the impact um, you know mobile betting could have, magnify those, and that's what you could have with with Bitcoin. And I'm not saying that people can't can't do it well and and become fairly wealthy doing it or or manage it, and it can't become an important part of the comp uh, excuse me important part of the um, economy. But it is a very, it, it I think is at this point is still something that you have to be very well educated to understand uh, if you want to do it successfully. And I'm not sure that everybody's done that, but I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, no, I mean, 100%. I mean, I think I think the biggest thing is it, it's not it's not a store of value. I, I can't tell you the number of times people have said this is a great store of value similar to gold. You know, I, I, I definitely don't agree with that. The thing, at least when I look at Bitcoin, ultimately it's it's not, it doesn't pay me dividends. It doesn't generate cash. I have no idea, you know, from a balance sheet perspective. I mean, there's there's nothing tangible to really point to. And so, even from an investment standpoint, if you if you want to have an investment in it, that's fine. But I would keep it at, you know, rather in that bucket of, you know, I'm okay to lose a bunch of money if it doesn't work out you know, in terms of does it really affect or, you know, what are the implications on the broader economy? Today, I just don't think it's a factor. I think you're able now to obviously have, you know, more convenience with being able to use it as a payment method. But ultimately, you know, you could simply make, you know, cashless payments, whether you're talking about Venmo or PayPal or, you know, Cash App or what have you, that, that I think you can ultimately make, you know, payments using, uh, you know, those avenues, uh, you know, similar to that of Bitcoin, but, you know, I think a, a lot more convenience can be had with, uh, with that. And, and I'm not advertising this, but uh, I know, I think it's on PayPal. You can buy into these currencies now uh, on those sites. So the availability is out there. You can buy and it's, it's not cheap. I mean, it's, you know, there is a cost to, to buying, uh, you know, through Venmo, 
you know, crypto. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be a few dollars, but when you look at from a percentage basis, I mean, it's probably anywhere from one to, you know, I don't know, 4% in terms of, of what you're being charged to make that purchase. And do you see this as being an area where you will see a lot more regulation as, as time goes by? Or are we in the wild west where we're staying right now? I, th I think over time you'll have to, if it becomes even that much larger in size, at some point you're, you're really gonna see meaningful uh, regulation. So I'm gonna turn, uh, go ahead, if you have something else to add here. No, I didn't, just was gonna agree with what Tamar said. So two final uh, items I wanna ask you about, and, and this is uh, more for Tamar on this first one, is this issue of environmental, social, and corporate governance, which we're hearing a lot about this ESG investing where we're gonna you know, invest in, in, in priorities that we might have socially. Uh, we saw some move on this uh, with Exxon uh, in the last quarter, and then some, you know, uh, rebuttal from critics to Exxon Mobil uh, right after that. How is that going to? Is ESG, this environmental, social, and corporate governance issue, going to impact the markets, or is it just so small in the in the bigger picture right now? No, it's it's definitely been been growing. I mean, you're you're seeing more and more dollars uh, moving into to vehicles that have ESG values as part of their investment approach. I mean, I think I've seen year over year growth of anywhere from fifteen to seventeen uh, percent, and so it's here to stay. It's going it's really going to continue to grow. I think you know you look at, at at you know companies, for instance, and I've looked at studies in the past that look at at you know, companies that have really adopted ESG and, and, and really have, for instance, you know, diverse boards or have gender equality when you look at their labor force. And ultimately studies have shown, I think this actually was coming out of Bank of America that show that companies typically have a higher ROE or return on equity uh, you know, by way of employing high values as it relates to ESG. I think though that even while the, the approach you know, has, has been around for decades now, there's still a lot of ambiguity with regards to how do you score and how do you rank companies. So I've seen in the past where certain, uh, you know, companies that, that rank ESG factors for corporations vary wildly between one company versus the next and looking at that same business. And so, you know, I think there's still a lot in terms of, of development there. But a lot more companies today are really adopting ESG. And even with, their, with regards to their disclosures, you know, you look at, for instance, Apple's website or even JP Morgan's website, you know, they've got uh, you know, a whole, you know, whole slew of information with regards to what they're doing on an ESG front. And so uh, again, I think it's here to stay and it's gonna continue to get uh, quite large over time. Go ahead, chime in, please. Yeah, I, no, I actually didn't have anything really to add there. I mean, I think Tamer said it well in terms of, you know, it's how important it comes to be. I mean, obviously m and um, has set up our own uh, ESG group uh, with, with um, the person leading at one of the highest levels in the bank. And um, obviously we have, as many companies have done, has added a chief diversity officer as well. Uh, that's obviously been something that's become um, more prominent over the last five to 10 years. And so I think those those things are going to be important, um, you know, as, as people think about companies, whether it's just joining a company, you know, I think from an employee standpoint, or, you know, maybe as Tamara thinks of more from investing, you know, co companies, people want to be at companies that they feel, you know, are, are responsible. So one of the largest uh, pension funds in the United States happens to be in the state of New York. And I know that the comptroller of New York is getting some, who manages that fund, gets a lot of pressure on that. Will this issue towards whether it's environmental, getting out of oil stocks or whatnot, will that really come from big pension uh, managers or is it gonna come from individual investors or is it not gonna come at all? I, I think you're gonna, you're gonna continue to hear from, you know, whether it's pension funds or just you know, large investment companies, let's say a BlackRock for instance, uh, that ultimately will continue to exude pressure on on businesses to, you know, not just, you know, adopt ESG values, but also disclose. You know, that's the biggest thing in terms of, you know, what we're seeing is really disclosure. And I think the one of the biggest concerns that you're hearing is, 
you know, that fear of greenwashing where, you know, companies ultimately aren't being, you know, 100% forthcoming with, uh, you know, what they're doing on, a, on an ESG front. But, um, but again, I think, you know, it's really going to be from, from both large institutions and individual investors uh, showing interest and, and really, invest, really investing in, uh, you know, these type of, of investment vehicles that, you know, look for high, you know, ranked ESG companies. So last question uh, really comes out as to what, what you see is the, the outlook. Obviously, the president has gotten some of his, he's got his infrastructure bill through, but you've got this Build Back Better bill that is um, stalled. And, and I know originally many investment advisors were factoring that in, into their, their outlooks. Uh, is there going to be a reverse impact if they don't pass this bill when it comes to construction or infrastructure items that may have been part of that? I know higher ed was a piece of that uh, when it came to community colleges. And obviously, Jill Biden, the, the first lady, has said that's not part of it. But there are other issues in daycare that people were hoping for. If they don't pass something like that, is there a reverse impact on the economy? I don't think that that it's I, I think from a first of all, from a sentiment standpoint with regards to the market, I you know, I think you're you're probably gonna see investors be disappointed. Will it completely reverse from an economic perspective? I, I don't think that the impact uh, you know is gonna be as as dire as as one would would think. I think you do have again a lot of positive factors and catalysts that I think will continue with. Uh, helping grow GDP. Again, the consumer is is in great shape. You know, many of us, ultimately, with obviously with young ones, uh, haven't been able to go out and dine at restaurants or take vacations or you know do all sorts of traveling. And I think that's going to be the next leg with regards to really getting the economy uh, in a much better position on a go forward basis. Uh, but again, you know, I don't. Maybe Peter might think otherwise, but I don't. I don't know if, if necessarily, you know, if it doesn't go through that, it will be a detriment to the economy. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I, I think it's a speed bump on the way. I, I, I agree with most of what Tamer said. I think the economy is poised to just continue to grow at a pretty profound pace, especially with, with what he describes. Uh, and I would agree with on, on what the consumer is going to do as considering it's, it drives so much the economy. Um, and so I, I, I think it's, it's not, it, you know, it could help um, how much it's going to hurt. Uh, I, I mean, always, you know, maybe it, maybe it's a small, um, like I said, speed bump in the in the stock market. But I think from an economic output, it's it's not as it's not a huge impact. Well, gentlemen, we want to thank you for your time. We've had Peter Neese nice of uh, uh, M&T Bank uh, giving us uh, his perspective on what the, the macro outlook is on the uh, economy, as well as Tamar. Elzebergi, uh, who is from Tompkins Financial Advisors, to talk to us about uh, the markets and what's out there. So, gentlemen, thank you for uh, joining us for the Wednesday morning roundtable. Um, we will be back next month, uh, as we said, with uh, a discussion on healthcare, uh, one, the second and a third uh, series on the impact of COVID and also the economy. We'll uh, finish off in April with a, a discussion on workforce development and how that's impacting. Uh, the world around us. And then our last program for 21-22 uh, is the Veteran Services. Uh, and we'll talk about that, uh, those impacts as well locally uh, that we have a program uh, set for. We do want to thank our sponsors again, uh, Tompkins Financial, uh, excuse me, Tompkins uh, Bank, uh, who has been a, a longstanding supporter of the uh, Wednesday Morning Roundtable, as well as the Allen Family Foundation, and the Fred L. Emerson Foundation. I'm Guy Cosentino for Pew Community College and the Wednesday Morning Roundtable. I want to thank you for joining us. We hope to be returning in person sooner than later, but otherwise enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>